Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit Patreon.com slash VMSPod or PayPal.me slash VMSPod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. A pretty uneventful week for me. Uh, no lightning strikes, lots of reading, recorded a podcast, had dinner with a, a past pod guest, which is the closest I come to hanging out with or even having friends, I guess. But anyway, um, oh, yeah, I also uh, submitted a letter to the FDA docket on policy recommendations regarding the use of blister packaging for immediate release opioid products. But I try not to mix business with pleasure here on the show. So Let's dive into this week's conversation. My guest this time around is the Argentine cartoonist Liniers. We met last year at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus and hit it off pretty well during an evening with a whole bunch of other cartoonists and the show organizer. Liniers teaches up in Vermont. He was at the Center for Cartoon Studies and Dartmouth, which we'll talk about in the conversation. And I pitched him on the... Uh, you know, if I ever make it up to your neck of the woods, possibility, while secretly holding out hope, he would come down to New York City instead, because it's a long haul up there, even though I probably could have gotten a bunch of episodes out of the trip. May still be in my future. Lucky for me, Liniers came down to New York first, along with his family. And lucky for me, um, he discovered my podcast after CXC Weekend and um, been listening for a while and was glad to let me know he'd be up for recording. Now, Liniers has had a pretty huge career in Argentina um, with his, his daily comic strip, Macanudo, and he made a big splash in the U.S. last fall when King Features began syndicating his strip here. Macanudo is um, indescribably wonderful, and the indescribable part is because while there are a couple of recurring characters like the the little girl Henrietta and her her cat Fellini and the imaginary ogre named Olga and and a bunch of elves and some penguins um there are a ton of throwaway characters and premises so this is not like Calvin and Hobbes where you're just following Henrietta and Fellini everywhere um they can go out the the window for weeks on end while he explores other characters other jokes um, sometimes the jokes go out of their way to avoid punchlines. Uh, other times he manages to deliver something a little, a little more gorgeous and, and special than a laugh, even though there are lots of laughs on balance as you read more and more of the strips. Uh, but he, he breaks down panel construction conventions, demolishes expectations for what you think is going to come in a comic strip. And, Sometimes it could take a week to get to a joke that kind of peters out and quietly shuffles off stage, self-aware that it will succeed next time if it just tries harder. Um, and all of this is done in these these gorgeous watercolors. Macanudo is just a, a marvel to behold. Um, I'll put a link to it in the, the show notes for this so you can make sure you, you bookmark it and check the strip out every day. Uh, during the conversation... We talk about the a few of the the last great comic strips uh, post Calvin and Hobbes, but after the loss of Cul de Sac, this is just about the only strip that I follow regularly, besides Mutt's. Um, so that makes it a great comic strip in my book. Now, as far as caveats go, we recorded in the. 128 Bar and Bistro on the second floor of the Society of Illustrators in New York City. Um, Actually, it's the third floor. They were kind enough to turn the music off in the, the venue. 
but there were people walking around, having drinks, having a, a you know pre dinner sort of meal, and looking at all the amazing Batman related art from the current exhibition that's going on there uh, of Chip Kid's collection. That said, while I was a little uptight when we first started because of the the background noise, it really makes for a nice vibe. And I'm thinking of asking the society if I can use their space occasionally for the appropriate guests. Anyway, here's Lanier's bio. Born in Argentina in 1973, Lanier's began his artistic career when he realized he wasn't cut out for law school and started making fanzines for friends. Since 2002, when his daily comic strip Macanudo began appearing in La Nación, Argentina's most widely read newspaper, Lanier's has become an international comic star, with many New Yorker covers to his name, among other accolades. Macanudo is published throughout the world, and Lanier's social media reaches nearly a million followers, some of whom I hope will be listening to this show, which, by the way, Lanier's contends is the first English-language podcast interview he's he's ever done. Um, but getting back to it, in the U.S., Lanier's is also the creator of wonderful children's books, two of which are about one of the greatest characters in Macanudo, the wry philosophical girl Henrietta. Lanier's also tours Latin America and Spain with musician Kevin Johansson, drawing on stage while Kevin's band performs. Lanier's currently lives in Vermont with his wife and three daughters. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Ricardo Siri, better known as Lanier's. So tell me, New York, you, you got to see Al Jaffe, you got to see oh, Peter Cooper. Man. You did, yes. the very first time I heard you speak in, at CXC last year, you did mention that at least in Argentina, the only way you were going to get a newspaper cartooning job was for one of your cartooning heroes to die first. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but you, you did manage to, to overcome that without anybody dying. Mm -hmm. But what's it like seeing a hero like like Al Jaffe? Al Jaffe, that that thing, my my well, my father. I mean, we all get too mad for someone, for some grown up that goes like, "Hey, kid, you know, read this thing." And when I was ten, eleven, you know, something like that. My father was very, he thought it was very important for me to learn English. Mm -hmm. So, and I was a very avid reader. So he would go like, whatever you read in Spanish, I am, you know, you have to buy with your allowance money. Or whatever you read in English, I will buy for you. Nice. You know, so of course I went like, okay, mad. <laughs> and at that point there was some mad magazines in the kiosks in Buenos Aires. So I could get, get that. And also like Stephen King books. Those, those were the two <laughs> things that, you know, got me hooked into English. But the sad thing for my, my father's a lawyer. And the sad thing for him was he thought he was very, being very like cunning and smart about like getting his kid to learn English so that he would grow up to be a very, you know, accomplished English, high culture yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> lawyer. <laughs> but if you get kids... A 10 years old, you know, Mad Magazine, the lawyer thing starts to erase, like, <laughs> you know, and uh, sadly he realized that of his mistake, you know, I can speak English, definitely, but then I started drawing penguins and elves and I was like, oh, what did we do? Oh, no. So, yeah, I love those guys. And Al Jaffe was this, you know, he was this standout in the magazine because he was always in the same place and that, you know, little... There's no way to mistake exactly. him for somebody else. And, he was, yeah, we yeah. were talking yesterday, yeah, he's in this history of comics. But is that a comic? You know, it's narrative because he has two images. Yeah. So it's, you go from one to two, but he's not doing it the same way every other comic in the world works. It's a different way it works. Are we going to dive into Scott McCloud territory this yeah. early in the podcast? <laughs> yeah. so, <laughs> so it's, it's a absolute, you know, you never forget that guy. Yeah. And also he draws funny. He, there, there, I have met so many people that draw very well, and so few people that draw actually draw funny. Yeah. And he's one of the funniest. I mean, oh. it's him and Gary Larson and you know Matt Greening and that draw really, you know, draw really, fun, draw really funny. I'm very sorry, everyone. This is not my first language. So. <laughs> You'll be fine. And I learned from Mad Magazine. So. <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> now, I met Al here at Society of Illustrators uh, maybe a year or two ago and, mm. you know, told him, uh, you know, worshipped yeah. at his, his altar. And a guy comes up to me. He's like, is, is that Al Jaffe? Mm. I said, yeah. He's like, he, he, he created my sense of humor. I'm like, you know what? Mm. Go tell him now. 
because yeah. he's here. You're here. What are the chances gonna you're both going to be here again? So yeah, he just ran over and, and yeah, it's it's you know those heroes of yeah. one. That's the thing that I'm. I feel I'm really lucky about on my end of the job is that I get a lot of little kids that read my strip, and I know how they are going to like me when they grow up. Yeah. You know, right now, if Al Jaffe comes to me and he hits me for money, I will <laughs> give him whatever he's like, hey, dude, I need a thousand dollars because, you know, I'm back on the rent. I will well, spare him Jaffe, money in a second, yeah. <laughs> you know. So I know those kids will be there for me <laughs> when I'm old. <laughs> Remember, Olga? Uh, yeah, give me some money, kid. <laughs> Economy in Argentina. You, yeah, you need to watch out hard, for that sort yeah. of thing. You've got a plan. You know? So... I, you know, those heroes of mine from when I was growing up, and it could be Argentinian cartoonists that I love, like Kino, Fontana Rosa, or, or, or the guys from Mad, or, you know, Bill Watterson, or like those guys that my father was trying to let, make me learn English from. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, you feel like you owe them something, yeah. which you don't because they were being paid. Yeah, but it's still, <laughs> well, it's, it's a question for you. When did you, you, you mentioned how, you know those kids are are going to be there for you. Mm. When did you realize you so, had an audience? What, like, what was that moment of holy crap? People are actually reading what I do. Yeah, when I, yeah, because it's it's yeah, it's a very weird job. And in Argentina, the the comic world is the the only place where you can kind of make a living is on the this you know the last page of the two big newspapers mm -hmm. or three, and uh, and those guys everybody knows. So everybody knows the, the cartoonists from the newspapers because there are like 10, you know, 12. And it's where people who don't read comics read comics. So my grandparents would read them. My aunts and uncles would read them. And they would, couldn't care less about comics. But they would know, oh, my Tena, Kino. And so that's, you know, if you're there, at, you know somebody's going to be reading you. But my strip is kind of weird and kind of schizophrenic. So at the beginning, it's a lot of angry people that reads you. <laughs> also, you replace something. In my case, I replaced Zitz, the American strip, yeah. which I love. But it was very badly translated. It was like translating a generic Spanish and not Argentinian Spanish. Oh, so it, it wasn't working. And so nobody had to die for me to get that <laughs> slot. But uh, I, I, you know... I was getting like confused people. I <laughs> had a couple of letters going like, what is this? It's about penguins. It's about what? And then I published my first book. And when I, I presented this book in a news, in a museum in Buenos Aires called the Malba, which is like the MoMA here, I would guess, um, a lot of people came. Like it was filled, it was people outside, and it blew my mind. And also, I was a very shy, you know, <laughs> first yeah. author. And it, but I went like, oh, these people are like those people that were sitting there are reading this. It's not only my cousins and my friends. Yeah, people who were obliged to yeah, tell you. Yeah, people I had no idea who they were, got out of their home and, you know, walk all the way or took a bus or whatever to the museum. Uh, that, that's when I went like, oh, this is gonna, maybe this is my job. <laughs> Was that more intimidating than the very nature of just doing a daily strip? It was intimidating being on stage. Mm -hmm. And so on that first time, I asked everyone I knew who had like a little bit of cachet, like uh, other pre prestigious cartoonists like Maitena, you know, I, uh, please be on stage with me because I'm, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to say. And she was, she, Maitena is a very well known Argentinian uh, cartoonist. And she was like, oh, yeah, I'll be there. Don't worry. Then I, I was asking like people from the newspaper, please come on, you know, like, then my publisher was there. Then I had a, f a couple of friends who were musicians. Please come with the guitar. And one of them came with the guitar and the band. And so it was like a Woodstock thing at the end. That's why, <laughs> that's why all the people was there. But yeah, so, and then I sit down and I realize that everybody's going to be talking me up for an hour. <laughs> because he's a genius, he's this, he's that. And I was like, no, I, I realized my, how, you know, bad a situation this was. And then, my turn is one one of those things where you like are breathing really hard into into the microphone and people. Are like, I want to thank no. the publisher and my parents who are sitting there. So yeah, it was it was very scary. But also, I said something and people laughed, mm -hmm. like some kind of like you know self deprecating, self -deprecating Woody Allen humor, yeah. Yeah, exactly, which is <laughs> what thing. we do. And they laughed, and that was also kind of like, oh, that's that felt nice. 
Oh. I, 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 what happens if I say that stupid thing again? I say it again. Oh, they laugh again. <laughs> oh. And uh, that ended up in me doing all kinds of strange stuff afterwards. Because uh, we... You I, caught the performing bug? Yeah. So I, I did a show with a friend who's a musician, guy that went there the first time called Kevin Johansson. Mm -hmm. We used to do a show together. And uh, now I also do a thing with a Chilean cartoonist called Alberto Mont. That where we do kind of stand up, but with a cartoonist drawing while the other one is doing the stand up. So you get like a, the the live thing is fun. Yeah. Yeah. Once you realize, oh, it's once you get rid of the oh, this is horrible, <laughs> then it's fun. <laughs> yeah, had it ever been a? Everybody has the rock star thing when they're they're kids. But, yeah. You know. We all. Yeah. yeah. I, definitely. As a, as every cartoon is. This is our yeah. second choice. Yes. Yeah. It's great, <laughs> and I love it. Definitely, my first choice was. Yeah, I want to be Lou Reed. Yeah. But that yeah. didn't work out for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have some problems with like rhythm and melody and sure. harmony but other than that you know but you do a bob dylan impression when yeah. you're on stage, so that's something uh, <laughs> you've been youtubing yeah that's scary man <laughs> i'm pretty because i yeah just for the poor people listening to this when we did the show with kevin johansson so he was had he's a great musician that has this very deep cool voice kind of learner cohen and he he, he would sing and while he sings, I would draw, and this would be projected behind us. And at some point, we thought it would be really fun just to exchange places, just so they could see how bad Kevin is at drawing and how horrible I am at singing. So that we, you know, yeah. just like running next to like Usain yeah. Bolt, you go like, oh, he runs very <laughs> fast. I think that's what the Olympics are missing. Yeah. You know, like Having one guy on the end going like, <laughs> and now the, you know, from New York, yeah. <laughs> he's been working out for a month and here we go. <laughs> puff. So it was, yeah, it was scary for everyone, but I loved it, man. It was really, it's just to play in front of a lot of people with 10 music band behind yeah. you. It, it feels <laughs> great. Now, when we talk about discovering an audience. Do you remember the first time you saw somebody with a tattoo of one of your, your characters? <laughs> yes. That's the one you never forget. Yeah, that's the what I was wondering. The first dude how, with how a bad? tattoo. Because <laughs> my family did not get a tattoo. You know, uh, don't you love me, sister? You know, she comes, <laughs> I, I made a tattoo. And we're like, oh, let's see what you got. A star? What the, you know, yeah. I'm your brother. You should get one of my characters. No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, and I will never forget, I really like this guy. He... You know, there's this tall dude with his girlfriend and his girlfriend was going like, show him, show him. And I thought, oh, no, <laughs> what are they going to show me? And then he started like pulling up, up his, his shirt. <laughs> his shirt. And I thought, oh, no, oh, no, he did this. And then when it's finally up, I have the whole array of characters, you know, and I always thought kind of like the first tattoo things were going to be like the mysterious man in black because it's kind of like you know, gothy or whatever. Yeah. No, he had tattooed like a little teddy bear that I draw. <laughs> Mandelbaum? Or at yeah, least that's how Mandelbaum. It was <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's the sweetest thing, dude. <laughs> and also, since it's the first time I saw someone with a tattoo, it was like, what are we now? Are we friends? Yeah. Are we like, <laughs> what, what is our relationship? I don't know what our relationship is. It could be is. worship. Yeah. 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 Watch Am I your messiah? Yeah. Uh, what, is, what is this thing? <laughs> So he was really nice. And every now and then I, I will cross paths with him. And he was like, I'm the Mandelbaum guy, Madariaga. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that's, I, I think it's a generational thing also. It's, I started doing these things when the tattoo thing kind of exploded. So, sure. you know, it's kind of the same thing with the blogs. That's also the thing that really helped me is if I would have, you know, hit this thing 10 years before, it would have been another thing. But... As Just soon as the blog it. showed up, it was my strips over there. People did not know what to put in the blogs. Well, let's put the little drawings. So nice. <laughs> I had like a whole bunch of... Also, what did for me was, okay, I'm doing all these drawings and they are like spread on the internet for free. I'm not getting a penny from anyone. So it took out all the guilt from downloading music from oh, Bjork. It could offset your karma. It Much was like... like I'm a, I'm a lobbyist for the pharmaceutical industry by day. I do this for no money. Just for the zero karma. My karma. Yes, that's, that's how so I felt very comfortable on downloading Beck's latest, you know, because Beck definitely could go online and see he my little drawings for free. Anything. Yeah. And that's why Beck and I you know, get along so well. Right. <laughs> Hi, Beck. I'm sure he's a big listener. Yeah. Now, 
if you were going to get a, a tattoo of another cartoonist's work? Oh, that's a whole bunch of them. I would be like the you're guy just, from Ray Bradbury. Yeah, I was going to say the illustrated man. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it. Yeah, Edward Corey. I would get Mouse. I would get like a whole the, everyone because yeah. I, you know, I would get like Monty Python things because <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, that's the thing when I was growing up, all these movies and books and cartoons and it, it was just. I don't know, I think the brain when you're a little kid, is, it's like crackling with electricity or whatever, and everything is amazing. Yeah. So when I was that kid, I was like, oh, I'm reading a book. And I was oh, misery is not so great. Yeah. Everything was kind of so, you know, spiced up that I loved everything and everything went into my mind. And when I sit down and draw, I know there's, you know, I'll, you know influence over all that stuff. Yeah. So in my books, you will see a lot of reference to all those people from Chaplin to the Pythons to Woody Allen to whatever, just because, you know, those guys blew my mind in different <laughs> yeah. ways when I was a kid. And so I, I, I will not get a tattoo because I'm a coward. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like anything pointy, you know, yeah. close to me. But the way I do tattoos is my drawings. So we, you will find in the drawings, you know, suddenly like a John Cleese or a whatever. <laughs> just maybe it's in the background, maybe it's in the foreground. But, you know, The Simpsons or Stephen King or Steinbeck or Vonnegut. Like I do a lot of covers for Vonnegut books cause, just because that guy. <laughs> yeah, you, know? you could imagine. Jeez. And you're almost, well, we're almost around the same age uh, within hmm. a couple of years of each other. You're in a way better shape than I do. Well, you I, know, I, that I, running I, thing. <laughs> I only took that up in the last year. And as you know, running has now led to my becoming a, yeah, it's a, a very bloody sports thing. Yeah, it's, it's blood from my boobs. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> that, that, that's a great image, man. Yeah, I was, yeah, I'm having nightmares. It was, last <laughs> that's Saturday, way, it was way better than Stephen King. It was an 11 mile run, and we stopped around mile. 10 for some reason I looked down I'm like oh I'm bleeding out of my boobs well we only got one more mile to go I may as well just keep you know that like good old nipple blood man. yeah oh, I was, I, was I, mean, I sent a picture to my wife before I drove home just so she exactly hey sweetie she <laughs> keep her from freaking out when I opened the door that was that was basically it but, mm. but yeah we both came of age in that and I know mm. Argentina's going to be a very different culture than northern New Jersey mm. um, but there was a media things are so controllable. Like hmm. We had crazy influences, but it wasn't like the internet era. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's so much that you can't even you know, begin to, to assimilate it all. Yeah, it's good and bad. I mean, it's. I, I think it's better. I would have loved that when I discovered, oh, I love the Velvet Underground to, like, in a second, have everything. Yeah. You know? On the other hand, every time I get, like, a new Velvet Underground record, it would take me maybe years. You know, someone would have to travel to the states and please get me you know white light white heat or whatever and they would come back i, I didn't get it so when you finally get the re got the record you would sit down you would read everything thrill of the chase meant exactly something. who's I, the sound mixer here <laughs> you know? this is how i won over thomas dolby when i recorded with him i told him back oh, in yeah? college i had a friend who was going to Germany that summer, pick up the Flat Earth on CD because mm. you couldn't get it in the U.S. We had to, to pick it up there. And he, oh, okay, you're, you're not just exactly. a kid downloading everything. You actually, you know. So that would generate like a, a fetishistic also relationship to, to culture. Yeah, the object. You know, exactly. I, I remember having all my DVDs and then they were kind of going away. My wife was like, we have to get rid of this. And I was like, but do I own the godfather now yeah. i don't know if i have the godfather if it goes away <laughs> yes it's in the computer i don't know what that means yeah. well, I, I keep about a dozen backups of all this yeah. stuff but it's the same thing exactly yeah. so I it's uh, you know i managed to hang on to my bob dylan cds just because i was like it took me a long time to build this whole oh, so thing my here. take is all <laughs> those kids who are buying vinyl all the other records now the moment they finally move and have to yeah. go somewhere else and realize this, this weighs a lot. This yeah. is taking up too much space. That's when we're going to see the, oh, yeah, yeah, vinyl sales it's are starting to go. drop again. Yeah. <laughs> once, once they get a new apartment, yeah, it all goes away. <laughs> but, uh, but, but tell me, you're, you're living in Vermont now. Yeah. We'll get to how you ended up there uh, mm. later. But what's the, the cartooning community you, you came up in in Buenos Aires versus, and I mispronounced that hardly because yeah. I'm an ugly American, uh, versus you know what you see in the U.S. and the sort of cartooning yeah, it's, 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 on the one hand, it's harder just because it's not 
as industrialized as here, you know, here there are agents for cartoonists and stuff like that. That doesn't exist in Buenos Aires. Yeah. Even the schools, like the way I figured out cartooning was, you know, I, I oh yeah, I like Calvin and Hobbes and Mafalda and this. Okay, I want to try and do that. And then I sat down and tried to figure it out. That's yeah. how you did it. And then I went to a, a workshop for a couple of years. Then I became friends with the guy that did the workshop. Then it was weird that I was giving him money because we were just talking about whatever, every, anything but. <laughs> Uh, but that's it. That's and so everything I kind of you know I figured the watercolors myself, the kind of drawing I do, it kind of like you know it's not very academic just because I, you know, it's, I was trying to understand it. And then the way it works, it, it works here in the in, in Vermont, for example, with the Center for Cartoon Studies. These guys get in two years what took me twenty just to figure out not only the technical aspects of making a daily strip, but the or the historic or whatever, but the the commercial aspects, which it's always the, the, the like the business side, the of business it or the side which is always yeah. what every cartoonist like have no idea. Nobody How do goes I get this yeah. job. How do you do this? Nobody yeah. goes like, well, will I be in the stock exchange or maybe no? I'm going to do comic. That that brain doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> it's always some really nice dude that wants to you know draw. And uh, so the cool thing about the, the these guys in Vermont, in the Center for Cartoon Studies, is the commercial aspect, which is always kind of like a, you know, the, where we are lacking every yeah. cartoonist, most of them at least. Uh, it's it's good that they give you like some legs to stand on that. Mm -hmm. Like I I think that's really good. In Argentina, there's nothing like that. There's no agent, no nothing. You just go and you know hit doors and. Yeah and knock on doors and you go like, hey, I want to do these drawings. Generally, you, you end up in some newspaper working for free, you know, because they go like, oh, we don't have money, kid, but you can do some of your drawings. <laughs> okay, sir. <laughs> then the really like artist eyes of exposure. Yeah, which is uh... kind of how I started. You know, they weren't paying in this newspaper in Pagina so they weren't paying me. But also what was cool was so they couldn't fire me. <laughs> you yeah, know, I how do you fire someone you are not paying? So I kept showing up every week. He's filling space. And they were feeling more embarrassed this time, <laughs> you know. And I was keep showing up and showing up and they couldn't get rid of me because nobody could fire me. And I kept, <laughs> and at some point somebody went like, okay, let's get these guys some space and some money. And, and that's how I started the daily strip thing. It was a weekly strip back then. Mm -hmm. Did you run into the... The challenge early on of, holy crap, I had about five good weeks and now I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, it's a, you always say yes to a job that you don't know how to do. Yeah. That's our job, you know, from the beginning to we are lucky that the first thing that they offer you is not, oh, you're going to have syndicated stripping, you know, King Features. That's not the first step. Yeah, you got to work your way. The first step is a fanzine. And then from the fanzine, you go to the university little other fun, the more yeah. prestigious fun scene. And then from that one, you go to the little drawings here. So each one of those steps, I had no idea what I was like. Yeah, you, <laughs> you want to do a weekly strip? Sure, no problem. And then you go like, yeah, I don't know. And then when I went from the weekly to the daily, that, that was scary because, you know, I knew I, I had like a strip in me like once a week. But then, and I would draw, at the beginning, I would take the whole week to make one strip. Then I did like the two floor thing, like the Tony Millionaire Mackies. Yeah, yeah. And I remember that I literally stole from Mackies that yeah, design. Who in Argentina was going to know? That's yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> Tony Millionaire out. was not going to find out. <laughs> but me being so, you know, always kind of, you know, feeling guilt, I found like Tony Millionaire's, uh, you know, the, Oh, is it his email? And, email and wrote to him, Mr. Millionaire, I'm very sorry, but I stole your design for this trip just because I need to, but, you know, I love Mackies. Uh, I hope you're not angry. And he wrote back like, I stole that from Harriman. It's fine. It's true. Good, kid, it all goes back enjoy, yeah. kid. <laughs> so thank yeah. you, Mr. Millionaire. You do have to remember there was a great comics journal interview with him where he tells a story of how he accidentally got the Libyan embassy bombed back in the <laughs> <laughs> It, yeah, it's a weird story, but I, you know, I'll say that one. But I'll let Tony tell it. But. I love that guy. So yeah. the, that the, then from that to the daily strip was scary because I really had no idea if I, what on the one hand what this daily strip was, on on the other hand, just if I could you know if I had more than fifty strips in me, 
I have no idea. And then I went for it. Just you say, yes, I can do this. No problem. You look like you're cool yeah. while you're saying it and then you <laughs> scream in the street maybe just hand in the strips <laughs> yeah. and hope nobody freaks out so. now um the decision not to have a, you know a calvin and Hobbes, not mm. to have your regular continuing characters to just be as fragmented as as yeah. as your current work is I, that i think i was lucky just to be in in argentina mm -hmm. because the that's the thing you could be very experimental there just because the, 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 if you're lucky enough to get that spot in the newspaper, they kind of let you go like, oh, go wherever you need to go, sure. right? So if I would have been pitching my work here for syndicates, I would have been more like, oh, well, now they're buying like a family or this yeah. or that. We need to get into the, you know, middle America editor mentality or whatever, how it works there. That in Argentina, it was like they are not even reading this thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I would realize by going to the to the newspaper that they they had no idea what they were. <laughs> Once I was in, they were like, "Oh, sure." They, yeah. they, I think they didn't care that much. So the thing I I remember thinking even back then was, I will do the strip. You know, from all the strips that I love and admire, which especially the American ones like Calvin and Hobbes or The Far Side or. I love everything of those strips. I didn't want to do like the kid strip, but I did want to do it too. I didn't want to do the experimental one only, but I wanted that too. I wanted to have... So the one thing that this strip does that is, I think, very different and weird is it has not only the different characters, which you could get in other strips, but the different types of humor. Yeah. Because the thing with the far side, it has it's one humor, right? It's kind of absurd humor. And the Calvin and Hobbes is kind of like, you know, very funny, yeah. kind of slapstick humor. Yeah, it, it knows. And then the other ones are political. Like, so I want, like, I want to do anything. And I want this space to be as free as I can, and then the reader will not see the, the punch coming. You know, it's just like you're a boxer in, in comedy. If you, you know, if you telegraph your punch, they'll know. They need to not see it. And if so, if you're doing one day like a very, ah, oh, how sweet he is. If you, the next day you do like a dark humor, they go like, oh, yeah. what's well, that? Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. I love yeah. that experience as a, a, as a reader of, a, you know, watching a movie or whatever. When you're like laughing and then you go like, oh, what happened? And then oh, and you're laughing again and then you're laughing, but very nervously. And then you're just. I, it was I, still our Pulp Fiction moment. I, exactly. I went, well, the moment when he. he Accidentally shoots him in the car. And I remember the, you know, yeah. so clearly everything about that moment when I saw it in the yeah. what the theater was like, what it smelled like, just because all my everything <laughs> the synapses went instant. crazy. What did I just <laughs> saw? And so you know the Tarantino movies. And I'm happy. I, it's just like a Pavlovian thing. People go like, oh, I don't know if I like this one. I am You're sitting the down ride. there, I'm hearing like any like 60s or 50s, whatever song he, someone puts on the like the beta max tape, whatever, <laughs> and I'm happy. And this last one, I was so happy. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone yet. <laughs> I'll have to. I'll it's, be. it's, uh, yeah, it made me happy. Thank you, Quentin. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we get him on the show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, the strip moved to the US how recently? So last uh, September, almost okay. a year ago, yeah difference in humor that's the cool thing that the, you know i was and that's one thing that was kind of scaring me yeah. before going into this is i've been doing this strip for like 15 years by the moment right and i become like very i i i try to be as honest as i can with the strip so if i am in a weird place the strip is going to be weird yeah. if i'm a happy place you know and for me it reads almost like a like like a diary like I can go like, oh, I remember when I, how sad I was that, you know, over these trips or how happy I was over these ones. Uh, and my my fear was, OK, now I'm going to, into a corporation kind of thing. And will they go like, no, we need you to do the punchline and the this and more zits or more. Yeah. And but the, so the first the only thing I told them was the, uh, very king features for me. You know, I just saying the list of you know Popeye and Crazy yeah. Cat and all that stuff uh, it's you know Mats, it's everything that could blow my mind to be just on this list but I cannot change it 
you cannot come to me and say like, okay, we need everything to be the little girl and the cat, or uh, we need you to be more tame or more. Yeah. Just because get rid of the elves. I, I am not in control of these things. <laughs> yeah, this is how it comes out, and they were very, very generous and very happy to go on this. Mm-hmm. I, I am yet to, you know, get a note of yeah. creative note from them, That's... which I'm very thankful to them. <laughs> any, any I'm pretty sure they are going like, "What did you just send? Okay, <laughs> no, just you know. better show him." <laughs> And it's a pretty big launch as far as this day and age for for a U.S. Trip. Yeah, they were super happy with it, and I am very very happy with it, and it's great, and it's yeah. Did it's, you have to do sales pitches or just explain it to? to yeah, the, I explain to it to the sales, you know, the yeah. sales force behind this thing, which was great. Like I've done everything, just me and my wife, and you know, a couple of friends. We've been pushing this thing. And suddenly you get like, oh, this is the team. <laughs> and I, I have a team. Cool. Oh, oh. And they were also very nice and enthusiastic. And they were like, oh, everybody's kind of liking this thing. So, uh, and yeah, I, this it was not also, <laughs> it was so not in my plans. That's what I was wondering. Like, was there a, yeah, it was the, the 90s, and, you know, Kurt yeah. Cobain had just bought the farm. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm going to draw some penguins. And, <laughs> and you know, in my mind was maybe if I get to Uruguay, then my <laughs> father would believe me that this is a real job. Because like, <laughs> it's an international success. Yeah. And so this is as far as my, you know, imagination could go. Like Uruguay. Montevideo. That was my, my, which would have been great for me. I would have signed with the devil. I would have done that Robert Johnson thing. It was fine. But so everything after that, it's been like, you know, this extra love I gotten from people. And, and, and it, so I have a very happy life, you know. And your folks get it? Yeah. Finally, they go like, oh, okay, yeah, it's a okay. job. So it's you can support job. himself from a family. Yeah. 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 At some point, they, 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 because it must have been scary, you know, when your 22 year old goes like, you know what, that whole lawyer thing. And remember when I was telling you about being an ad man? Yeah, no, I'm going to, these elves, I want to drop out. <laughs> Those hats are going to get taller and you taller, know, but dad. I'm going to show the world. That's what, you know, kids should do with their parents, scare them. Yeah. At least a couple of times. That's Again, that's the tattoo thing. I exactly. Think. <laughs> what Some people get tattoos. Some people, you know, go into strange, deranged experiences. Uh, I, I do comics. <laughs> Again, as long as they came around and as long as you're able to, to you know. Yeah, no, no, they're very, no, it was, they were to their, uh, you know. I want to really compliment them because this was as extraterrestrial a thing you could tell your friend from my father. He's yeah. a lawyer. He works for a beer company. He's being, you know, very like clear path to his life. And suddenly he has this kid going to him. It must have sounded like, daddy, I want to go to Mars. Or, you know, you don't understand, dad. You know, there's people going to Mars, dad. <laughs> and suddenly I was like in this rocket. I was like, oh, he's going to Mars. Go figure, you know? I'm actually going. So, but even before that, they were very, like, once they dealt with it, okay, he's like that, it's fine. It's probably our fault because all the fucking <laughs> mag- magazines we gave them. But, yeah, he, we'll, we'll be behind you. Go for it, kid. <laughs> we'll feed you. <laughs> we'll keep feeding you. And the comic you were actually able to propose to your wife. Oh, yeah, that was a weird one. (laughs) That's also when I realized they were not reading the comic, because this was Uh, before. This was in the weekly comic. Yeah. It was called Bonjour. And, uh, yeah, I was getting to that moment. Let's get married with my wife, right? And I was, I should do something fun. I have this thing in the newspaper, and it's always kind of weird. Maybe I could just, you know, propose in the comic. (laughs) <laughs> so I did a strip where it was on the top part, like the Tony Millionaire thing. It was my characters looking at the bottom one, like, oh, he went nuts. And on the bottom one was just me going like, hey, Angie, let's get married, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then that morning she was sleeping and I kind of like, you know. Oh, hey, honey, the paper. Showed up with a newspaper and the breakfast, which was strange in it itself. <laughs> and I said, like, I read today's strip, Angie. And she read it, and she was kind of sleepy, like, oh, don't bother me. And then she realized her name was in the newspaper. So she took some time to say yes. But 
<laughs> we're throwing it at you first. But then the next time I went to the newspaper, I thought like people were going to go like, hey, dude, great. Or did you say yes? Nothing. They hadn't <laughs> read the fucking strip. <laughs> and, you know, that I felt gave me like absolute freedom. I go, oh, if, if they're not reading, I can get away with anything. <laughs> you, here we go. Soon to be a married man. But. Yeah. <laughs> You know, actually, when you talk about the 20 years of, of teaching yourself hmm. how to draw, how to do the watercolors, when did you feel confident, or do you feel confident? When did you find your style? Uh, I, yeah, I, the, the two different things. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't I say confident by any exactly. means. But <laughs> I've, I, you know, it took some time. It was like it's a growing thing, the style. Uh, I do remember the, t the moment when I made a strip that I found funny and weird and crazy and strange and it made no sense at all but I thought it was funny and then I was like oh this is what I want it was some penguins and some really nonsensical strip and I was I don't understand this strip yet it's really funny to me <laughs> and then I, oh I want to investigate this so that that's kind of I found like some stylistic thing to the humor the drawing it was an amalgam of different artists that I like that my first cartoon I always told this in my classes my first character that i made i just got the low part of the f face of the you know mouse character from art spiegelman <laughs> yeah. and i gave him long ears from the from the mud greening life in hell characters and then i thought like oh they can't sue <laughs> As this Mac is an original... As Mac Groening put it, <laughs> copyright infringement is the sincerest form of flattery. Exactly. <laughs> no, it, it's... And also, I was in Argentina, so my mind was like, they'll never find out. You know, even if I publish in Uruguay, they will not <laughs> find out. And then what's super crazy is that my sister, Juanita, in Argentina, calls me one day on the phone and says, uh, Oh, hi, Ricardo. Do you remember my friend Agustina from school? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I remember her. She, yeah. mm -hmm. And then she goes like, well, she's dating the guy that makes The Simpsons. You know, <laughs> mud groaning, greening. Yeah. I was like, what? Are you on drugs, Juanita? <laughs> And I don't know. So Matt Greening was, he married and he has like five kids with my sister's friend. So eventually I met him and I had to come out and I was like, Mr. Greening. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but the years of the bunny thing. And he was very happy. He was like, dude, it worked for me. Go for it. <laughs> and then also the Art Spiegelman also, we crossed paths in our lives. And he's, you know, so, yeah, they're very, very non-litigious. Well, unfortunately, the, the one time I met Matt Grading was at a, um, a Brooklyn Comics Festival. Mm. And we met by turning a corner simultaneously and smacking into each other. Yeah. And even though he's larger than me, uh, he was the one who plummeted to the ground. Oh, so you th threw... I body slammed Matt Groening. <laughs> and as I'm lunging to try to catch him, I realize, hey, that's Matt Groening. And then had the... might be the highest net worth person I've ever slammed to the ground. This is... You know, really it could... Not hurt by any means. So it, was, it was good. But but yeah, I did feel a little guilty. But it's that. nice to have that little bit of slapstick moment with uh, one yeah. of the great uh, comedians of... Uh, you well, know. One of my, my past guests grew up with him, uh, Richard Gare. Uh, lives, lives over in Brooklyn. He's hmm. profiled a bunch of New Yorker cartoonists, and he had the great story. The two of them were science fiction kids growing up, and Matt calls him here in New York and says, uh, we're recording with Thomas Pynchon today. Oh. Do you want to come meet him? <laughs> yeah. And Richard's like, yeah, yeah, Matt, you and I were reading V to each other as kids. Yes, I want to come meet Thomas Pynchon. So uh, Richard comes out. He and Matt meet Pynchon and his kid uh, to record the, the voiceover for The Simpsons. Yeah, with a Richard, bag on his head. Yeah, the bag over his head. Yeah, Richard and, and Matt are both freaked out that, oh, my God, this is Thomas Pynchon. Pynchon's kid, oh, my God, this is Matt Groening. Like, to him, oh, I don't care about my yeah. dad. You're the guy who made The Simpsons and is totally melting down around That's him. That's so, so cool. Yeah, we all have our different levels of, of heroism. I had yeah. one almost, like, one. this could have been the best story yeah. that you could ever have, but it's not. Mm. <laughs> because, I, I, so I was presenting the first Macanudo book, and they were doing a little tour through Washington here and there. Mm. And I was in Washington, and the tour presentation was always like five people there. Yeah. <laughs> so I started talking with a couple of them. Once Mike, Michael Kavanaugh was really nice, and, and this other, you know, dude, and he's really nice, and we started talking about, yeah, and he's, uh, 
he said, like, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, oh, well, I'm going to Vermont because I go to this school. And I have to talk to these people. It was before we came to live here. I really had to had this meeting. And I was, oh, that's so bad because, you know, Bill Watterson is going to be here tomorrow. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, his yeah. friends, so, you know, maybe. And I'm like, he comes out? Yeah, he's like a normal dude, only he doesn't like, uh, you know, any yeah. type of attention. I'm like, oh, but I have to leave. So I just pushed all these books on this poor guy and just give him this and, you know. And uh, and oh, the next okay. day, of course, I go to the Center for Cartoon Studies and I meet James Sturm, uh, yeah. you know, who's going to be nice and enough to invite me to be the, do the fellowship there. And I told him, well, you know, yesterday I was in Washington and this guy invited me and maybe Bill Watson was going to show up. And he looked at me and says, but what are you doing here? Yeah, I, I'm Why sure are you here? Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're an idiot. You're... Yeah. Uh, because you are a report. No, <laughs> you, you stay. Go... It's comics code. You can so, call and say it's a Bill Watson. It's the, yeah. So that's the my not meeting Bill Watson well, the, story. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it, it, it was actually when I recorded with Caitlin McGurk at CX, at uh, um, uh, the Billy Ireland Library in Columbus. Yeah. They had just uh, launched the Bill Watterson and Richard Thompson exhibitions mm. uh, the week before. And she said he did come. They went out to, to lunch with the, the, yeah. the administrator at the, the library. And that was Caitlin's moment of realizing I'm sitting with Bill Watterson and nobody knows this. And that's exactly. why he's that's why he did this, so that yeah. you know he doesn't get. I re I yeah. really get why he yeah. does this, and it's a uh, it's the, that strip, of course, it's the, blew everyone's mind. Yeah, it's I don't want to say the last great strip, but, but it's, it's kind all, of the well. Last. The cul de sac is definitely you know yeah up cul de sac there. and and mutts when and uh, mutts, when Patrick I was think, rolling. Yeah, there. definitely. It's it's and Macanudo, whatever. But yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah. the, definitely those. But yeah, it's but, but for us, we was, had that, yeah. that that that. But you that could Europe see the relationship the between cul de sac and mutts to yeah. Bill Watterson. You can. Right. It's just such a perfect strip. It's 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 scary. Yeah. Like I, that's how I started doing my daily strip. You know, I would do like one and go like, yeah, that's kind of okay. And then you have like right next to me a whole bunch of you know far sides and Calvin Hobbes and Mafalda and all this stuff. And I would go like, no, it sucks. And then you go try <laughs> again. And then uh, yeah, so they raised the bar so that we had to work harder so but that's what's not to love there yeah that's a lot better than you know yeah. just half-assing it and, and mailing it in yeah, but, yeah but what did you get better at in terms of drawing oh i'm still trying and yeah. uh, you know it's it, it's it's still an evolving thing and you yeah. can see it very clearly if you see those first macanudo and the strips that i do right now that we moved into the middle of the woods yeah. Suddenly, my <laughs> trees and my... You they, actually know what they look like? Yeah, now that they go like, oh, it's not like a little stick and greeny, you know. Uh, it's uh, So I, I like looking at stuff and then figuring out how to draw. And I buy... I'm, I'm an okay guy at drawing, but I'm not very good. But I realized that that's not my job at some point. My job is not being very good at drawing. My job is I have to come up with these little doodles or whatever and somehow you have to in, influx like this fake but as real as you can make soul into it mm. so you know people think that calvin is a completely different thing from bill watterson or people will think like because they go like that kid is incredible he's so funny he's crazy and you go like that's not a kid it's like a grown-up and yeah. he's drawing the mafalda who's our you know kid star in Latin America or from a daily strip called Mafalda, which is kind of like the peanuts, how it works, a little bit more ideologically charged, which I really recommend because it's a great strip. Yeah. And and I would get all the time, yeah, Mafalda is this little girl and she has these amazing ideas about the world. And it's not a little girl. It's, a, again, a 40-year-old, 50-year-old guy doing those drawings. But it's so well done the Tintin and Mafalda, it, it's almost like they exist separate from the, from the author. And the, the drawing of them is so abstract and so tiny. But on that little drawing, they made that little soul work. Yeah. You know, like a Gepetto thing. And, and that's the job. You know, the, the drawing really well job, that's like Caravaggio's job. Or, you know, Neil Adams' job or whatever. <laughs> it's definitely not my job. My job is, okay, this little round thing with a couple of points and weird teeth. 
now people need to believe that that exists, that it's a monster, and that, and it, it represents this or that. So when I realized that, I st stopped, you know, hating Over myself yeah. just because I don't understand where a deltoid is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not, not having any of our. That's own. the that's thing. The also, <laughs> you know, if I had some kind of, you know, tonal, you yeah. know, most I could draw some kind of superhero. <laughs> I have one superhero in Macanudo called Captain Deja Vu. <laughs> what I do with Captain Deja Vu is I will draw like, oh my God, that's Captain Deja Vu. And then I copy paste five or six times. <laughs> that's the strip. I always tell that story. There was a, I think it was Howard Chaikin who had to draw Westerns and didn't yeah. know how to draw a horse. And oh. so people would point off panel. Here he comes on his horse. And then you'd see the guy walk on the panel later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. The worst, the most difficult things for people to draw is horses and bikes. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the almost impossible drawing is a horse riding a bike. It's That's perfect. the impossible drawing. <laughs> and whoever figures that one out, it has all my uh, uh, well, the <laughs> admiration. One that, the one that killed me when I was talking to Jaime Hernandez, he's talked about how much he hates drawing cars. Like, but, mm. you, you know, your strip is in Southern California, yeah. right? <laughs> you understand everybody's in a car all the time. I hate like, yeah, drawing cars and you almost don't see them in Macanudo just because I yeah. hate drawing them. And and every now, so every time you see a, a, a comic where people are enjoying drawing cars, it's like, oh, this is how I should do it. Like, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it doesn't no. stick. It doesn't <laughs> stick. I think if Jaime launched again, he would put it in you know, rural Vermont where <laughs> yeah. everybody's in the woods or something. But, you know. but talk about teaching. Like, when did you... Uh, Mm. I know you started a few years ago. Did you feel qualified to teach? No, I still don't, but I'm very happy to <laughs> yeah, do have it. They, have they caught on? Because that's, <laughs> you know, that's the thing, the, the teaching aspect of it, since I didn't get like an academic, you know, uh, education Training, yeah. in it, I just read a whole bunch of things and I tried to come up with my ideas about them and then I tried to figure out my strip. Is I am, I'm never very sure if what I'm teaching them is that, you know, work? like, so I'm going to teach you guys about watercolors. And then you go like, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is not how it's done, but here we go. So you put a little watercolor there and then the yeah. pen, and then you add some things and then it's, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you feel that, uh, but on the other hand, you, you know, if, if the students are into it, you see them go from this place to a little bit higher, you know, to like, I, I, because also there's two different type of class that I did. So once was while I was at the Center for Cartoon Studies as a fellow, we would talk to the guys and they are very, they're into this, this thing. So they would ask about nibs and how, you know, grammars of how many grams the paper and yeah, all like, the technical exactly yeah. and sometimes you have no idea and they go like where are your nibs from i don't know in argentina we don't get like to choose one nib forever <laughs> you get whatever you get but but yeah it so it you know it's very like punctual and very detailed and it's a little bit scarier because you go like i'm you know they're gonna figure this out i'm just <laughs> i don't know how i ended up here <laughs> On the other hand, I was doing some classes in on in Dartmouth in the Spanish department, uh, and uh, those students are not there because they want to be cartoonists. They're you know they're they're doing all different careers and they are you know want to improve on the Spanish and the way they do it on these classes instead of reading uh, you know Garcia Marquez, they will read you know the Eternaut. The cool thing about those students was when I started talking to them. So yeah, I asked everyone, so, you know, write down your favorite uh, graphic novels or comic strips or whatever. So just so we know what you guys like. And it was 95% Calvin and Hobbes and one Spider-Man. And that was it. And yeah. then I told them, did you guys read Mouse? And we're like, what? Yeah, because they're 20 years old and right. just cross paths with these they've been studying to get into that university so yeah. God so the, the second they go like what's mouth i went like oh i'm gonna teach them at least one thing i'm for sure that they'll learn one thing mm -hmm. guys go and get mouse <laughs> yeah but what was cool is i felt like i opened other than you know, teaching them a little bit of spanish i opened the door to a uh, graphic novel to this form of you know storytelling that's a weird door because it's not the door through Mouse or Spiel or Klaus or whatever, but it's through that of the Latin American thing, which is amazing. And it's very hard to come by here in the States. Mm. You know, Alberto Brescia or 
Westerheld or Altuna. There's all these amazing, amazing cartoonists from Latin America that generally they're very well known in Europe. They're not very well known here, although Fantagraphics, and they've been yeah. publishing it here, and there are some great books. But it's very hard to come by. And so they went into the graphic novel through a very interesting word, weird, kind of quirky door. And of course, also, you know, any cultural uh, form in Latin America will have its historical, you know, impact. So they were very interested in learning, okay, so this guy was, you know, disappeared by the mm -hmm. uh, military regime, or this was during the Peron years, and this was... So it had, like, also, the, they were very interested in the historical aspect of them. Mm -hmm. It was a yeah, <laughs> professor theory. Also, it was really cool, again, going back to my father. Because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love my parents, and it was the, the sweetest thing happened to me last year. So I was doing this class in Dartmouth and they come to the hotel to visit us, to visit their granddaughters. And at some point my mother, she kind of wandered off and then she comes back and see my father's talking to the person in the, in the lobby. And the person was like, so what are you doing here? And my father very, very like, you know, filled with pride. He said like, well, my son's a professor. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't like expand on that. He didn't have, out there, it was my son's a professor, and we're here to meet the professor and to spend time with our grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't have to say adjunct. Nothing no, weird. no, no, that's, no, no. That's, that's it. That is, maybe he's you know physics, maybe yeah, cartoons. We don't know. Economics. Leave it out there. But you, know, you mentioned your kids. Um, are you trying to keep them out of the family business, or are you? You know, oh, no, I'm making money out of them. Yeah. <laughs> Are they going to be uh, uh, yeah, that's cartooning? The, yeah, no, no I, you know, if there's one thing I learned with my experience is... You can't, the, you can't judge it. Not only can't, uh, can't you judge it, is if they're lucky enough to find something that they really love to do, mm -hmm. you become an unstoppable force. You know, if I would have been anything else, if I'm a lawyer or the guy from the ad agency or whatever... Mm -hmm. Uh, I would have been like really uh, people be in jail because of oh I forgot <laughs> to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so Violet, yeah, whatever. and that's most of the people. They kind yeah. of more or less like their job and they do it like more or less fine. But when you find, if you're lucky enough to find something you really like, you know those people dancing in Lincoln Center, they love that and they s jump like crazy forever just because they are loving their job. Well, if you have that luck then, you know, you'll figure it out how to make a living or, you know, we are now, if you're lucky enough to be uh, in a place, because this is a crazy, weird world, so this is, doesn't apply to the whole world. But if you're lucky enough to be able to choose your career, I think you owe it to the people who can't choose to choose well mm -hmm. and to find something you really love, because otherwise the rest of them can go like, you're an idiot, because we could not choose. You know, I had no, no, I couldn't do anything else. This, I had to do this because I don't have There's money, because no my country is fucked up, because this is that. So if you, who had that, you know, privilege and, mm -hmm. and that luck or whatever, did not take advantage of that, then you're an idiot. Yeah. And when I felt that, I felt like a responsibility. Oh, I need to find something that I really love. And if my kids find that, Whatever it is, however strange to me it is, like, Daddy, I want to be a lawyer. I will. Talk to your grandfather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be okay with me. Daddy, I want to go to the stock exchange. I will not understand it. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm, you know, 100% there. I go, okay, okay. Just don't but, bankrupt the Argentine government. Yeah, that's, that's, not again. Yeah. You can only go through it so many times. <laughs> oh, we're really kids. good at that. We can do that like all the time. Uh, this is our thing. Headed there again, I see. Yeah, yeah. Um, any of your kids good at drawing? Only because, I only ask mm. because there's one cartooning pal of mine. She hasn't been on the show yet, but mm. she says her child cannot draw to save his life. And he's old enough now that he should be able to draw something. And he's just terrible. And he laughs about how bad an artist but he is. But that's the thing also. If I was one of these amazing, amazing, like people Draftsman that genetically oh, yeah. that you know that genetically that they were born with that you know, yeah. like Picasso you see those paintings by Picasso when he was 12 and you go like oh my god yeah this is you know a gift then you would get like okay genetic some of that genetics would pass down to my kids but my 
draftsmanship. <laughs> like if you see them and they're not very good, you go like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> no, they, <laughs> Although it reminds me of the, uh, and it, it's another story I've talked about the, the crumb documentary yeah. when he, uh, you, I assume yeah, you yeah. watched it because we're all, we were that generation. Yeah. And also he uh, was an impactful artist, oh, you know, yeah. so he definitely was one that also showed me uh, this is the direction. And you have a couple of, of, characters who look crumb figure bigfoot oh like, yeah, yeah definitely that's it. at the beginning the first thing i did when i realized i wanted to do this i made all the feet smaller because yeah. everything looked crumb <laughs> too crumb like <laughs> but there's a scene where he and his his son are are both drawing from a uh, uh, a yearbook of some asylum hmm. and He's oh, trying yeah. to explain to the son, yeah. you know, the daughter, what yeah. to, uh, no, no, with that, uh, with Jesse, with his, his, oh, his yeah, older Jesse, son from yeah, the first yeah. marriage. Um, he, he's trying to explain to him, you know, you got to exaggerate yeah. the features a little. You got to do this and that. And he says, you should take some life drawing classes. And the son says, well, you didn't take drawing classes, dad. And Crumb just says, well, <laughs> and that's all he says. But what, what's in there is, yeah, I'm Crumb. Yeah, you need life drawing class. Yeah, yeah. You, you see, there are two drawings. The the son's one is photorealistic, but has no life to exactly, it. Exactly, yeah, is yeah. A, a crumb drawing. But that's the thing. It's it, yeah. It, whatever way you you figure this out, classes, no classes, whatever. Yeah. What's definitely has to be there is the gazillion hours of sitting down and doing whatever job you you know, want and to that's excel how I've at. Managed to avoid becoming an artist yeah. at any point in my life because I just don't have the stick to itiveness to do anything but this. That's, so. It has to be an obsession and like a, you know, uh, the the one thing that every guy that you know by name, even if you like them or don't, doesn't matter. You know, yeah, Adam Sandler yeah. or wh whoever you meant, Bono, whatever, whatever you mention, you go like, ah, oh, yeah, I know that guy. The one thing they all have in common is they all work like crazy at it. It's not that, oh, they're waiting for the muse. Because I, you know, when I was 18 and listening to Jim Morrison and reading Bukowski, I was like, yeah, I want to be that guy. I guess like drunk. And then sometimes you go like, oh, yeah. Uh, it's not that. And not even for Bukowski or for Jim Morrison. I'm pretty sure that most of the time they were just sitting down figuring this out. Like, this has to be good. So it's uh, the one thing uh, that that has to be, you know, and the only way to make that all, that amount of hours to give that amount of hours to something is that you have to be obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to find some, you know, it's not normal. It's not common. It's yeah. like most of the people don't find it. You know, they go, ah, I, I kind of like, you know, watching movies. I kind of like watching sports. But every now and then there's someone go like, I need to do this, like, you know, Tarantino. Like, I need to watch every movie and I need to want to figure out everything. And I want to talk with everyone. Well, that's how you do it. There's no shortcuts, not even for Picasso. He was very good, but then he had to sit down to and start working. Do you wish you had a cartooning education like uh, what you do now? or what? what I know that I'm lacking tools, and I hate when I feel that lack of those tools. You yeah. know, when you go like, especially like computers, all my strips are watercolors. And, and, but also it gives them a, like a really different vibe from the rest because the rest of the newspaper is all done by computer. So yeah. I'm the only one that, you know, maybe there's someone else, but generally I'm the only one doing watercolors. Yeah. And then, so it kind of helps sometimes because the thing with those tools is everybody has the same tools. Everybody has the same Photoshop mm -hmm. program. So if you if you're there just to, if you're using those tools to like as a shortcut, it's not good. If you're using those tools to get the most out of it, like you can see it with Chris Ware or, you know, like you go, oh, I wish, uh, you know, I could have that chops of design to make this thing work. But also <laughs> then you see the original that he does and he does everything by hand. Yeah, which, <laughs> so you realize, wait a yeah. second, Ware's not using a computer. Because I used to <laughs> use this example of him being like designing everything in his computer and then you come oh, here and everything and little papers. <laughs> paper. yeah. So that's another genius. So, yeah, yeah it's, but, uh, I, you know, well, I, I don't something. know how much it would have helped or not, but I know that I'm lacking tools and I kind of don't like that. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it's something that came up last week with Milton Glaser when we did our, our show to him. He doesn't touch a computer. He he directs his mm. his staff and how to, to or what he wants to see and how they do it. But his take was uh, the computer makes you good at the things a computer is good at. Yeah, like yeah. replicating or certain types of of pattern. You know, it's like well, that's what the computer can do. So you end mm. up doing more of that instead of. Yeah, it's a tool. Good. It's yeah. like a ruler. You know, yeah, you're gonna make get a really good, strong, straight line. Yeah. But it's 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 
who's using and how and why is using that tool. So sure. some people, you know, they'll do something that will blow your mind. And some people, you go just, okay, they did the cylinder thing, <laughs> they did the effect on it. Yeah. <laughs> the little, you know, the color shading. Oh, yeah, I haven't seen that before. Yeah. Oh, the blur. <laughs> um, you've done a couple of longer form kids' books yeah. at, at this point. Doing those versus doing strips. Oh, it's so much fun. It's, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, the kids' books, especially the two of the kids' books that I did, one is called The Big Wet Balloon, and the other one is called Good Night Planet. Those came from that, you know, different part of oneself. Yeah. Just because it's my kids, you know, and I just looking at them one day and go like, and when you have kids, the one thing that we have all parents I know in common is like you're looking for the pause button, you know, <laughs> I want you to stay like this forever. You're so cute and perfect and funny and, you know, you love me and you don't hate me like you will in a couple of years. So you, there's no pause button. They, they, they keep growing, growing, growing. And, uh, and those books were like me going like, oh, you know what? I'm going to keep this day for me. Yeah. I kind of, I'm, cause one day was my two eldest ones were, it was a summer rain and they went out to play in the rain. And I just realized this, there was this dynamic between the two of them. One was kind of scared of the rain because she was three. And the one that was five was kind of really enjoying it. And I'm like, oh, this is just such a beautiful thing. I want it for, me, for myself. So I just sat down and started jotting that I, those ideas. And the other one, Good Night Planet, is about we moved here. And I took my girls to a to toy store because most of their toys were back in Argentina. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Emma, you know, grabbed this little deer plush toy and I asked her, what's the name of your new friend? And I was expecting, she was two and a half. Mm -hmm. So she had like 50 words total. And I was expecting like Toto or Poopy or whatever. And she went, no, Planeta. <laughs> I'm like, what? Are you into astronomy? I had no idea, little girl. And then I had like this Planeta in here and we had like a puppy and I went, oh, let's run with this. And those two books are not going to be forever my yeah. favorite two books just because it's those days i have they're mine they don't get to grow out of them yeah <laughs> do you think of doing more long form yes i did do a graphic novel called posters mm -hmm. in uh, that i published in spanish i haven't published in english yet which is very experimental and strange i did do a graphic novel with a with a writer called mario belatin mm -hmm. from mexico peru mexico is Mario is a very strange, interesting, and amazing, amazing uh, literature uh, author, and he gave me this story, and I adapted it. And so there's, I, but whenever I go outside of Macanudo, I don't want to do Macanudo the, That's the graphic I was novel. How different a so style the, exactly. Do you have to work so the Mario that? Velatin thing is about the you know, an entomologist uh, from Japan, and it's all about eating and the really weird versions of eating. <laughs> Because, you know, Mario has this kind of like strange kind of David Lynchian aspect to his, but on a very personal way. Uh, the other one, the posters one, is just this completely deranged kind of like, oh, brother, where art thou? Yeah. <laughs> just because that was, was in my mind while I was drawing it. Just because Oh Brother Where Art Thou is based on Ulysses, so I can say that I did something based on Ulysses. Right, so you get the, the whole connection. <laughs> yeah. And also, I remember the coins going like, "Yeah, we based it on Ulysses, but we hadn't read the thing." So <laughs> I think they were full of shit. I about think that, no, but whatever, none of us read Ulysses, but it's based on Ulysses. And uh, <laughs> so, I, but I, like I tell you, when I go out of Macanudo, I don't want to make Macanudo strip. So I, I, I'm not working on a graphic novel with my wife, which How is How challenging fun. is that, though, to work in another... It sounds like you, at least from the pages I've seen of your your, mm. your tunes books, it's a different visual style. Yeah. You know, and, and how tough is it for you to, to kind of seg between that and doing the daily? Well, I, but that's the fun of it. Yeah. it it's, I could not, I would never understand, like I admire very much, but I, I can't understand why Schultz would draw everything the same way forever. You know, like I get it and it's what generally we do, but it's like you were going into like an arcade and you were told, okay, you get to play Pac-Man. And you're like, okay. And I love Pac-Man, but, you know, it's well, Space right. better right next to me. And there's the pinballs over there. And why can't I go and... So 
Seriously, by the way, I was at an arcade two weeks ago yeah. uh, with my brother down on the Jersey Shore, and it was all 80s and early 90s stuff. So I'm playing oh, Sinistar. Man. I have to go and there, Dick man. Doug and, and all this. We were playing our Adams Family Pinball, which is what my brother and I bond <laughs> over. But in between, I, it was just all of the, the horrible video games that destroyed our minds. I we was kids. I was with my kids the other day at yeah, like a pizza place, and there was a Galaga there. Oh, my God. And I told, oh, I used to play this, Matilda Cam. I'm going to show you. Put it in a quarter. And I could not lose. Yeah. I was it all came back. like, my, yeah, Matilda was like, you're a genius. I was, doo -doo 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 -doo. and he was like, I can't lose. I, had, I haven't played this thing in 25 years or whatever. Uh, yeah. It all so, comes back. Yeah. It's still there for some <laughs> stupid reason. But, but again, the, the idea of drawing differently than, than so the for me it's all it's always panel shapes and, and composing in pages and it's of so much fun here. and it yeah and you're, you're figuring it out and you're outside of your the, your comfort zone mm -hmm. which is for me very important to do what we used to do with my friend kevin the musician was completely different so my my comfort zone is this little square you know very kind of yeah. four by 12 inches and with kevin at the beginning I, we, while he played with his band uh, I would paint like a big mural behind, and it was like a huge, you know, I don't know, eight feet by how many? I, you have a very weird measuring system here. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a huge thing and completely different from the daily strip. Also, where, I, where I'm doing my daily strip, I have whatever time to be smart or funny or whatever. Here you cannot think. You're just painting and painting, and whatever happens, happens. And so you're absolutely outside. And you have to figure it out because people paid money to see this thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember... You can tell yourself they paid to see Kevin. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, they're paying to see me and then they have to stand Kevin's music. And <laughs> <laughs> But I remember one time we did this show and it was like a 2000 seat place. And it was a big place. And it was, okay, here we go. And the show starts. Kevin starts playing. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I'm sorry, Kevin, for imitating <laughs> your baritone, beautiful voice. And uh, and I start, like, you know, grabbing the all the pots of paint and grabbing like the brushes and I realized that all the brushes were whiter than all the openings in the oh. pots of paint like somebody hated me <laughs> so and you cannot stop the show you can go like is there an artist in room yours <laughs> that's it you have to figure out how to paint a whole wall with yeah. so you I just grabbed this like very angry at some, anyone the produced production or whatever I put my hand in and started like flinging like paint into the thing and then I started like pretend like Jackson Pollocking the thing <laughs> and then and by the end it looked like something kind of weird yeah. and cool and I remember going down and the guys from the van were like hey, it was more punk today dude <laughs> and uh, and so it's you know I like being putting myself into situations where I can have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And then if, if I've managed to figure it out, I will be very happy and I will find something that will work for the next time. Because from then on, I was flinging paint like crazy yeah. on, on all my shows. On the toolbox. <laughs> I know. And you've got a Yankees cap on. Um, yeah, which is, just, I want to say, it's, a, it's the wrong hat. Well, for here, it's okay. No, no, no. For my head. Because oh. the reason I wear a Yankees cap and I have owned a bunch of them through the years yeah. is because of the odd couple. Like, I, lo <laughs> I love the odd couple. So I, I'm a You're Walter Matthau, you know, Jack Lemon through and through. And I love Oscar, you know, Oscar Madison. And I would tell everyone, yeah, this is because of Walter Matthau. And the other day I saw it again with Matilda. And he's wearing a New York Mets cap. Yeah, he was a Mets Not guy. A <laughs> <laughs> So it's the wrong cap. And this is how much Argentinians know about baseball. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was protective coloration. While you're in the States, you just want to... Yeah. Because I was going to tell you, I keep a gray-on-gray Toronto Blue Jays cap just to in my glove to... compartment. I'm not. A, I'm a Yankees fan, but yeah. my idea, if you're traveling in America, you might get beaten up for being a Yankees oh, fan. I Nobody will... hates the Blue Jays. So just put this cap on. Dude, and will I will through. use this in Vermont, and I go into the most interesting, yeah, like so you know, the Red Sox. Guys, <laughs> <I imagine. Yeah. laughs> Is there a point though that you um, you felt American um, since, I, since moving here? The, the the reason I I I, I feel the strip has an American connection is that, you know, I, I'm a 
kid from the 80s. Mm -hmm. And in the 80s, American culture was hyper ubiquitous in Latin America, yeah. especially in Argentina. It was all about Spielberg and George Lucas and, you know, and Matt. And, and so I grew up consuming a lot of this, you know, and I would read, I would go to school with English also, so we would read Steinbeck and, yeah, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird. So it's it's always been an influence in what I do, and I have the, I feel the strip shows that influence. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's a very Latin American strip, and I feel like a Latin American artist, you know, which I have no idea what that exactly means, because it definitely it doesn't mean uh, we are very mucho caliente, because yeah. <laughs> this is what we get all the time. So oh, uh, you're, temper, you're right? from yeah. Argentina, eh? mucho caliente, Ricky Martin, eh? viva la vida loca, and you go like, no, 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 no. Argentina is a very gray, <laughs> melancholic, yeah. you know, hyper an analyzed, you know, yeah. sad country, and you know, so angry. <laughs> Yeah. We are not mucho caliente. We don't know, <laughs> we don't dance. You know, there are people who dance the tango really well, but it's not like eh. Yeah, because every time I go to Colombia and I go dancing with my other cartoonist friends, they dance like it's beautiful to see my you know overweight <laughs> doing like oh you know and the salsa and you go like no no we don't do that. <laughs> So it's not a mucho caliente país. It's not a Ricky Martin país. It's a very weird. And the cool thing about Latin America is it's, it kind of varies a lot from country to country. Mm -hmm. And also there's a lot in common from country to country. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that unites us. And But it's definitely not the same Uruguay to Paraguay to Chile to Colombia. There was a really, like, I remember being very angry at this way back when, uh, the the Oscars they nominated a friend of mine. He became a friend of mine after this, but I was already a big fan called Jorge Drexler, and Jorge did the mu music for the that movie, The Motorcycle Diaries. Remember yeah. the one that Che Guevara, and so his song was nominated, and then it was like a couple of like Disney songs or whatever. So they thought he's not gonna win. And they thought, like, nobody knows Jorge Drexler. So they got Antonio Banderas and Santana to do the version. And they did not let Jorge sing. Oof. And they're very a talented actor and musician. The version was horrible. <laughs> it, was, it was very bad. Like, you know, I love those two guys. Yeah. It was a it very... It was not the right music for them. They tried yes. very, but it's not... It was not also not Jorge's style at all. Yeah. And then he won this thing. Which I was like, yeah, in Argentina, I'm like, yeah. So Jorge goes up, and Prince was handing the, the Oscar, and he gives the Oscar to Jorge, and he just grabbed it, and he sang it a cappella, like a couple of bars. <laughs> said, just thank so you. Didn't know what it he didn't thank like. anyone. He didn't, like, you know, oh, I'm so shocked, nothing. He went like, clavo mi remo en el agua. and it was beautiful, and he went, bye. And that's the coolest thing I have ever <laughs> seen someone do in the Oscar. So it's not everything, yeah, kind of the same, but. People are great all over. That's that's my take on Latin America, and I feel like a Latin American artist, whatever that means. I think it's the not knowing what it means that makes it Latin American. I think it's yeah, the, the not I'm, quite being able to define. I don't even know what an American is, or what uh, French, or yeah, you know, what what is it? Is it like you know, Groucho Marx is American, but it's also Adam Sandler. Is it? I don't know. There's a lot of like, what's Argentinian humor? I have no idea. <laughs> No idea. <laughs> Things that make them laugh. I know what. Yeah, I know what makes me laugh. I don't know about the rest of them. <laughs> Last question: While you're in New York, another cartoonist besides Al Jaffe, you're hoping to meet? Oh uh, well, I, I spent some time with good old Peter Cooper, which yeah, you know, but he's a friend. I love that I got to be friends with this guy. Uh, we met in Mexico, and you know, here and there over the years. And and he's just he's so, so smart, that guy. And he's going to put out a great... Uh, he was talking to you about the, the Joseph Conrad. Yeah, I, was, I didn't want to mention it in case it was a thing. Yeah, The Heart of Darkness. The Heart of this, Darkness. Uh, this fall, I think. Yeah, and he gave me an advanced copy. And it's really good. I, I really like the film. Way to go, Peter. But yeah, I, I love meeting cartoonists. Just because, you know... Do you I'm, still nerd out? I'm sure you did with Al. Yeah, Maybe, yeah. You, know, you, know. you try not to. The one time I was like shaking yeah. was uh, one time I met John Cleese 
<laughs> that I was like, I could not, you know, I was trying to get a selfie. My hands were shaking. I, I could not yeah. figure. I, I had, I have, I still have dreams where, where I'm, <laughs> I'm with John Cleese and I can't figure out the phone. Because you know how you can't read when you're yeah, dreaming? Yeah, numbers don't, well, don't show up. Turns there. out you can't work your phone either. <laughs> it's that everything moves. And I was like, wait, Mr. Cleese. Well, I have a nice little selfie. But yeah, when uh, sometimes you'll meet someone that you go, like it happened to me with Art Spiegelman and Francois Bouly that I really admired. And the first time I met them, I was like super scared. And now we are kind of, you know, they're kind of very nice and friendly. They realize, or you need to realize you're a peer. You know, you're, you're not just a, it's, a fan, but it's, they, they know your work. Too. That's the best thing. Yeah. That really is uh, the nicest thing that can happen to you is if you meet someone you admire and you go like, hey, Mr. So-and-so, I, I, I like your cartoons. And I'm Liniers. Oh, I like what you do, too. Ah, that's the best feeling ever. ever, Sh- ever. Shannon Wheeler told me about that. Yeah, he met, he uh, met Eddie that Campbell guy. years ago <laughs> yeah. at, uh, at Comic-Con with a whole bunch of people, and they're all walking and they're finally like getting to the hotels and leaving. And, and Eddie says, yeah, "By the way, what's your? Oh, I'm, I'm Shannon Wheeler. Mm-hmm. Oh, Too much. I love your man. stuff." And Shannon's like, oh, "Eddie Campbell loves it." You know, had he been introduced to him as earlier in the evening, it would have been better. But yeah, he was just no, in the final it's, moment. It's, it was boom. His head blew. Up. It happens every now and then. It yeah. happened when I met Shannon. I had no idea of my stuff, but I was like, "Dude," and I. And, but I realized that he thought I was bullshitting him. I was like, "Oh, well, Shannon, I love your stuff." And he was like, "You really?" Uh, and they were like, yeah, too much of- coffee, man. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You're, you're in. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're, you're not thinking about my, my yeah. New Yorker strips. You're not much you. <laughs> Anyway, I think they're going to be kicking us out soon. So, Ricardo, yeah. thanks so much for coming on the show. And, uh, you know, I'll try to make the trip up to Vermont sometime. Oh, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's, fun. It's, it's fun. It's the first one of these shows that I listened and saw. Because oh. <laughs> I've been listening to it for a while, and now I get to... You can oh. do this on TV, man. <laughs> I figure if any of us look good on screen, we yeah, wouldn't be doing this for that's a living. The <laughs> <laughs> you have to kick up like, oh, now it's Gil Roth with yeah, the makeup beautiful and people. Else and, yeah. But yeah, keep doing it with the ugly people because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, man. You're welcome. And that was Lanier's. His daily comic strip, Macanudo, runs at comicskingdom.com slash Macanudo. Comics Kingdom is spelled just like it sounds. Macanudo is M-A-C-A-N-U-D-O. You can find a bunch of collections of his strips in English from Enchanted Lion Books and dozens more of them in Spanish. Like they said in the, the, the bio, international comic star. We're just getting an appreciation of him here in the U.S. You can also get his children's books from Toon Books, The Big Wet Balloon, Good Night Planet, and Written and Drawn by Henrietta. And all three of those are available both in English and Spanish. Now, Lanier's is pretty active on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where he goes as Poor Lanier's, and that's P-O-R-L-I-N-I-E. R.S. I'll have a link to all those feeds in the show notes for this episode. And I swear to God, I did not mean to cut him off when he mentioned that he and his wife, Angie, are working on a graphic novel. I don't think I even heard it at the time, but when I played it back this weekend, I realized, oh my God, I should have asked all about that. But I just happened to talk at the wrong moment, as is my want. Um, So I'm going to get him back on the show at some point just to find out more about that. And after we wrapped, I asked him, so, who have you been reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The second quarter 2019 episode just went live and features an hour of book recommendations and fun conversation with Mark Allen Stamity, David Shields, Michael Carroll, Frederick Tutton, Ursi Sotoropoulos, Caitlin Foisy, Seth, Nina Bunjavak, Stephen Guarnaccia, Hugh Ryan, Bill Griffith, Boris Fishman, and Barbara Nessim. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. 
I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one at the Society of Illustrators on East 63rd Street. That meant a $12 toll at the George Washington Bridge, 30 bucks or so for parking, $6 for the subway, a couple of bucks for a cold brew, coffee, and um, that's about it. And thanks again to the Society of Illustrators for letting us record at the, uh, the 128 Bar and Bistro on the third floor. It was really a, a neat venue. Now, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, and coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Buzz Carter, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Kevin Katila, Jack Les Camella, Stephen Nadler, Barbara Nessim, Jim Ottaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Armando Veve, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going.